Right. Morning, everyone. Oh. Right. Now, clearly DevConf has been far too optimistic. It's time to inject some doom and gloom. <laughs> Hands up anyone here who's, who doesn't know about the 2038 problem. <laughs> Good. It's time to have some education. Um, the world is going to end in January 2038. I'll be honest, I do have a bit of a conflict of interest here. As you'll see, as well as being a Debian developer, I also own the domain fix2038.com. This is my pension that I'm spoiling. <laughs> so, quick, quick run through of what I'm going to talk about. By the way, I'm not expecting this to just be me talking. I do want feedback. I do want you guys to get involved. Um, so, what's up? When, when are we all going to die? What do we need to do to not die? What the current state is? And please, this is a boff. As, as I always run these things, I do promise I will send a summary of the discussion to the mailing lists later. If somebody can please take notes in Gobby, that would be lovely. So, time t. It's really, really simple. It, it simply counts the number of seconds since the beginning of 1970. For, the, for, for many of us, that is, that is really, really long ago. Some of us in the room were, bu were born before the beginning of time. Let's try not to mock them too much. <laughs> um, and of course, when the, when the Unix people in, came up with this back in 1970, um, well, 32 bits of t sorry, 31 bits of time t was plenty. It was never going to run out. It's like 640k is going to be enough for everyone. It's who who'd have thought it? So we have a problem in that it's it's signed, and therefore it's 31 bits. Therefore it's going to wrap, and it's going to wrap quite soon. We have a second problem in that this is used everywhere. Um, I'll go through that a bit more later. Now, imagine Y2K, except this time it's going to be worse. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> now, again, I, I'm not trying to exaggerate this too much, but for most of the things that we had to worry about for Y2K, they were big, obvious computers. You could point at them. They were mainframes, typically. There were a few other bits and pieces around you had to think about, but that was the core that people cared about. It was, a, oh, my God, are the banking systems going to work tomorrow? Or, you know, are the cellular networks going to work tomorrow? That kind of thing. Um, and dare I say it was a bit of an anticlimax. That's not because it wasn't a problem, but people did think about it and, get, and work on this well in advance. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, a little bit of an anecdote, the company I was working for at the time, I actually volunteered to be on call overnight for the New Year Y2K. Um, obviously, a, a suitably accelerated pay, you know, pay scale for that evening, because I was totally happy that I knew all of our code worked, and if it didn't, well, the mobile networks were never going to work, so nobody could get through to me. Unfortunately, my boss saw this coming and said no. Um, the, our big problem, as I said, when we get to 2038, is that we're not just going to be looking at big, obvious computers. Um, in 20 years, you know, if the sci-fi authors are correct, we're going to have the sensor cloud. We're going to have things that are too small to see, and they're going to be computers. Or they're going to be sufficiently like computers that actually we need to worry about this. Because, of course, you won't be able to go, oh, that computer needs fixing. It will be a, your washing machine will have a hundred different computers in it. And you'll have no idea how to talk to them, let alone to verify if they're correct. No. Plus, of course, planes, cars, um, underwear. Who knows what? But, you know, if it goes bad, it goes really bad. So, when does it happen? This example I actually took, or lifted almost straight from the man page for date. Other people are thinking about this. So, in, on the 19th of January, 2038, potentially we all go back to 1902, depending on how bad things, badly things worked. 
So what, in fact, needs doing? Um, we have lots and lots and lots of things from the bottom of the stack upwards. Um, in the worst cases, on disk formats for file systems. On disk formats for all kinds of other data as well, but the file systems we're using today typically are not uh, year 2038 safe. Um, uh, yeah, we... Uh, do also new file systems like X4, BRTFS, and so X4 on? The newest X4 file system versions are 2038 safe. They use 64 bits of time, which is 34 bits of seconds. So that will last oh, until we're all gone. And 30, 30 bits of nanoseconds, if I remember correctly. Um, most of the normal file systems that you're likely to play with today, however, will die. Um, I say they'll die, they will do weird and wonderful things, probably beyond just tell you the wrong time, but depending on exactly the code in the file systems, behavior will break. Um, obviously, this is a problem. Yeah. Um, there are lots and lots of places inside the Linux kernel where, you know, 32-bit time t is passed around. That's being fixed, I'll come to that later. There were Worse, there were lots of kernel interfaces, and above that, there were lots of libraries that, that use a 32-bit time t, and related um, variables, related structures that depend on it. So, and finally, obviously, all the applications out there that might be using it. A lot of people may not even realize that they care about time, but the interfaces that they're using from the libraries underneath embed it all over the place. So, Linux kernel. I'll go through what, what, what progress we currently have. Um, Deeper Dinamami, I'm probably going to pronounce that horribly wrong, I apologize, and Arne Bergman um, are running a project under the kernel newbies umbrella to at least work out what needs to be done here. Um, they have a page, they, and there is a mailing list hosted by the folks at Linaro where people are currently discussing this. Right now, while we have plenty of time to think about this, um, Ant and others are using this as a good way of getting people into um, early, simple kernel development. You don't need to know a huge amount to be able to go through and pick up, that looks like a 32-bit value that's being used for time, we should fix that, and at least uh, document it all so people can work on it. Um, They've started adding some 64-bit code in the middle. They've started fixing up drivers. Ah, and my slides don't fit. They've started um, adding new versions of interfaces, so IOCTLs, syscalls, and a few other things that you might not think about. I'm not going to go into all the details right now. The fun thing is, of course, that we can't just replace all of the existing syscalls because everything else will break right now, not in 20 years. Um, so what we're looking at doing is adding more equivalent versions of old syscalls. So the syscall table is going to carry on growing if, if, anybody, if anybody looks at that. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of tasks here. Um, if you go and have a look at that page, this is a great place to get involved right here, right now. There's a lot of help available, and people would love it if you, if you join in. So, glibc is obviously the next thing up the stack. Um, essentially, everything to a first approximation depends on glibc. Um, those guys are being as thorough as they normally are. They have really detailed plans that they've started in their wiki. They haven't started work on this. They're still drafting the plans. But again, they're going to be adding 64-bit time support in a new set of um, library calls without, obviously, breaking 32-bit support. Um, there's more coverage of this in a very good LWN article, uh, which I've linked. Obviously, the glibc folks cannot even start testing this um, until they have a 2038 safe kernel. Um, again, there is a huge amount of work to do here. If you're interested, those guys are also looking for help. Please go and dive in. 
So, elsewhere. Um, other work, again, if you're further up the stack, you can't really test much of this until you have the, the layers underneath you working. Um, but it's not clear how much progress people have actually put into this. Um, I'll admit, I intend to concentrate on Linux. I haven't looked at, at the herd kernel, at the K3BSD kernel, or sorry, at the FreeBSD kernel or anywhere else. Um, these people are all going to have to, gonna have to go through the same kinds of uh, solutions. Hopefully, people are going to come up with a new compatible way of working. Um, it, what a lot of the interfaces we're looking at at the moment that are broken are POSIX interfaces. I'm assuming that we're going to end up with new, new POSIX uh, approved interfaces like this, but there's not much sign of it happening yet. Now, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of libraries are going to need updates here. Anything that embeds a time T um, clearly will need fixing. Time val embeds a time T, so you may not realize time spec in embeds a time T. Almost anything that is using um, libc exposed timing functions is going to need upgrading, is going to need updating. You might not realize it, the libraries underneath your application might are likely to need it, because, again, anything that embeds things here is going to break. Um, so that, that's, that's why this is such a scary thing. It's not just a um, you know, set minus D, time bits equal 64 when we compile. Anything f that is embedding stuff here is potentially breakable. We're going to have to do lots and lots of mass rebuilds. And people are already talking about doing automated scanning for these things and trying to pick up where ABIs break, for example, because, of course, any library functions that, em that embed any timing functions at all are going to change in size. If you've been clever and kept this neat, then you might be great. If you think you've been really clever, you've possibly made it worse. Because, and I'll go start at the bottom of this one, whatever you do, do not bodge around this. People have had clever ideas like this so many times over the years where they think, oh, well, I know what a time T looks like, but I don't like using time T, or I can't guarantee I'll, it, I'll be able to have it on all platforms, so I'll use an int. That's great. It works for you today, but it also means that the poor buggers 20 years later who've got to go scanning for embedded time T won't find that code. Um, and, if, and the really clever people who start thinking, oh, I need a more flexible um, structure, I need a better way of storing this that is bigger, I know I'll store this in a float to a double. Oh my God, please don't. <laughs> really, it's the worst thing ever. Um, so, if the things that people can do now is help with the kernel and glibc folks. Uh, there, are there are people already working on this, there is an almost unlimited amount of work. Yes, Dimitri. So today I should be using time T and expect that it will change size. Or if I'm writing new code, should I be using like, is there like time 64 dash underscore T or something like that? Right now, your best bet is time T. Just use time T Just use and time assume T. that in but the future I'll have an ABI break. Exactly. Okay. Expect that things are going to change. But using time T and keeping on top of it is the right answer. Um, I use quite a lot of uh, structures in small embedded. Is it worth me padding a 32-bit in front such that my structures still align when we move to 64-bit T? Maybe. It depends. Where are you, what are you doing with that, with that structure? Well, I'm thinking more along the lines of any, any comms backwards and forwards, so when yeah. I move to 64-bit, I'm not going to hit um, any uh, word boundaries, uh, any, any issues of uh, block devices and so on, so I'm going to at least get the same performance that I'm expecting now with 32-bit T. Maybe. Um, you're saying about having something pretended so that it would still align. Alignment is highly random and unpredictable across architectures. So placing something in front of it now and then hoping it will still align when DimeT becomes 64-bit yeah. is a very I huge bet. I was thinking bit. more along the lines of my comms packets. And so yeah, but so still, and, it's a, it's and a bit. small embedded. 
what I will say is trying to second guess this might only make it worse. Um, what you may find is that by the time people have thrashed this out and gone, and gone through discussions all over the world, that instead of just going to a simple 64-bit value, instead we end up with a 128-bit structure with extra bits. And at that point, you've then left your padding, but you'll still have to do work later anyway. Yeah. So second guessing is hard. I appreciate that, which is why a lot of this is be aware this is coming, get involved, don't necessarily expect to be changing your code for this today beyond taking out the bodges. Um, so check your code, check and also check your dependencies. Um, as I said, there is a lot of code here that, that is going to break. So, as I said, that is the core of, what, of the message I want to give. Um, I'm not planning on talking about this much. I'll answer questions, but please, does anybody have any more questions, any more points they wish to raise? Bradley. No. So, uh, first of all, I want to say how annoyed I am that you're giving this talk, because during Y2K, I took a lot of mental notes, and I had this plan, yeah, hoping yeah. that everyone would ignore this, and in 2034, I was going to launch this consulting business. You've, you've seen that. Uh, did you come in late? I have... Oh, I, you said I, 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 15 years ago, I registered that domain, and I've kept it going with a, with a holding page But you realize since. that for that plan to work, we were all supposed to be silent till about 2034, 2035, pre right? Yes. So you're, you're you see, screwing up the plan, I'm, I'm being <laughs> I'm being altruistic, and I am destroying my own pension plan here. I, yeah, I, I hope all you of appreciate us. So you're, you're hurting everyone. Right? The plan oh. is to stay quiet till 2034, and then we launch our consulting oh. business. I'm sorry, it's too uh, late. There's no, management re there's no management reading this anyway, so uh, that's fine. That's good, <laughs> um, but in seriousness, so yes. I, I mean, I think I think one of one of the, th the things we we face is is up and down the stack, right? Um, and I'm wondering if is anybody working on? You mentioned this, the, the sort of scanning for this. There, there are sort of two related areas of computer science that are, are, are free software analysis stuff that are going on. One is the license scanning people. Yeah. Um, so they're obsessed with finding licenses. There's most of the license scanners are proprietary, but there are some free ones. Has anybody looked at applying that technology to finding time junk in code? And the second question related is, is anybody working on static analysis stuff and program slicing computer science stuff that would find where time t is being thrown into ints sure. and other sorts of things? I've heard that the Coverity people are looking at this, for example. Who? Coverity? Who? Okay, I don't know. Sort of free software. Not free software. Um, but oh, what, one, one, of, one of the best known commercial pro oh, right. products yeah, here I've, already. I've, and I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that people are already looking at this for the free software things. I'll be brutally honest, I prepared the slides the other day and I haven't had time to check back since to really look into that. Definitely it's something that, that volunteers to help with would be great. <laughs> run Andy, run. <laughs> So there's a class of uh, bugs that is like really slightly further out, uh, which is unsigned yeah. time, um, which exists, for example, in every single PGP packet, uh, unsigned time. So we have like a few more years to deal with that, but also it's definitely not in a time T because it's unsigned. Sure. So we have to like be looking for, some of those bodges aren't just because someone was trying to be smart, the format is actually different. Oh, absolutely. So I'm going to jokingly put my head in the sand and say, oh, it's never, it, don't worry about it, we're never going to get that far. <laughs> well, at least I'm not. Um, secondly, yes, uh, the, the kernel folks are looking at fixing this up better. So rather than just, uh, oh, we need to punt, punt this down the road, we're not looking at any bodge work to say, let's just extend this or let's, oh, uh, lots and lots of the Y2K fixes were just, um, let's change where the epoch is. So, in, you know, and assume anything with, in a, with a two-digit date must have started, must be relative to 1950 instead of 1900, that kind of crap. We can't do that. We, well, we, should, we mustn't do that. We're better than that. Uh, we have plenty of time to see this coming and do it right. Now, the reason why, again, a lot of us are making noise about this is, most of the systems that we are going to be running that we know about in 2038 are going to be 64-bit clean. But, you know, 
Debian and all of Linux distros, of course, are going to be fine because, hell, we'll have rebuilt the world. The big problem that we have is that um, the Internet of Things, um, we have a vast number of machines. We're going to have, by then, probably trillions of little machines, which we won't be able to identify, we won't be able to ward it, we won't know that they're safe until they fail. And, and, yeah, and we won't be able to rebuild them. So this is why we need to get this fixed as soon as bloody possible so that people building those systems will be able, you know, or not so much will be able to, but will just be building on top of things that already work right. And um, the 2038 is also the last estimated deadline, but anything that stores dates in the future, like expiration date of your carton of milk or appointments for next year, uh, or scheduling tax, whatever, or mm, yeah. expir when your child reaches mm, uh, uh, voting age, or that sort of things will start failing nicely in advance if it uses time T. Sure, absolutely. I think it's also an interesting question like uh, which systems or libraries use time T which shouldn't be there or it's not really necessary mm. for you, you for example you said time beam functions if i want to like know like okay five minutes have fast so like wake up and do something maybe i just do not need the 64 bits because it's whatever sure. i just i just need to yeah. know that like okay five minutes it's five yeah. minutes later than i started <laughs> yeah so hopefully absolutely libraries should not necessarily be exposing this up the tree anymore but of course internally they will be using 32 bit times for example, it's, it's how Select exposes things which, you know, for your event loop, that kind of thing. Um, we should be able, if we're careful, to fix those without polluting any of the namespace up the stack. Um, obviously, as I said, we're going to be looking for ABI checkers to absolutely validate that. Yeah. yeah I was just curious if you had any thoughts about, it seems like there's a proliferation of these statically linked, you know, things like Go and things like that. Mm -hmm. that Right. Yes. So just, just your thoughts there, because mm -hmm. it seems like we need to fix the, the libraries that they are statically linking in have to be fixed before we can even hope to rebuild yep. all of those. Absolutely. All of the, yes, it, it's, the, it's a great example of the problem that we need to fix. Um, we, that's looking, say, five layers up the stack or something. We need to make sure every layer underneath it is fixed early so that they get, A, get the time to make sure their stuff works, and B, that gives us plenty of margin to make sure things in the, out in the wild are already fixed before it breaks. It'd be nice to build a time bomb for what they have now. <laughs> yeah. So, on, on a related thing, like I said, for the inter Internet of Things uh, stuff, you know, there's a lot of people who have been worried about already uh, people shipping insecure devices or things that have no security support. Um, and it doesn't matter to the device producer because they expect to have already gone bust or moved on. There'll be three products down the line before anybody cares. Um, actually enforcing um, the ability to do updates safely, reliably, automatically on these devices is part of the solution to that problem and possibly also a solution to this problem. But actually making that happen is hard. So going back to the time deltas, so you want 64-bit safe, 32-bit safe, and overflow safe time deltas, right? <laughs> if yeah. you're calculating the math around it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So when I, when I commented before, I was avoiding mentioning this, but you brought up IoT. Um, now, everybody knows that I, I see GPL violations as the problem of, of, of everything, but yeah. it actually is a problem with the IoT devices. So even if Linux gets fixed, 90% I would expect of IoT devices on the market that use Linux are violating the GPL, which means there is no source code for the Linux they're running, there's no sure. instructions on how to rebuild it. So even when Linux gets fixed, and even if it's a Linux-based device, we probably won't know how to upgrade it. So oh, absolutely. I would add to your slide of things we can do now, uh, of course I would, but uh, <laughs> d the GPL violations actually relate to this, because yeah. if we have all these GPL violations in the next 20 years, they're all running Linux. We won't have the source code for them. We won't know how to upgrade the Linux that's on them, and we'll yeah. be stuck. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
And again, that also adds to the urgency of getting this fixed as early as possible. So um, GPL violations are really bad. You know I agree with that. I'm also more worried about this kind of thing killing people or causing uh, you know, other worse problems. Right, these GPL violating devices could kill people and we can't fix them before yes, that, right? Yes, absolutely. But, but I agree with you, if you, the quicker Linux in particular gets fixed, yeah. uh, the, the fewer times this GPL violation sure. problem will cause the problem. Yeah. Ah, You've been my. saying that um, people should just carry on using Time T for now. Does that, what, would that also extend in your view to people, say, designing a new on-disk format at the moment? Or should they do something else? Would you do something that's, else? That's a very good, a very good question, well brought up. Um, no, in that situation, of course, your on-disk format is not something you're going to be exchanging with somebody else in the same way that you do through a library or you know, in, in a, in, through an API. Um, Please, God, if you're doing a file system design, if you're designing an image format, if you're d designing a packet um, format today, yeah, think about this. Um, you, people are going to have to deal with your format regardless, so you don't have to interoperate in a clean way the same way everybody else does. Definitely think about this. There are good guidelines, in fact, if I remember correctly, on that Kernel Newbies page and on the GLibc page about how to think about this now if you're designing such a thing. Yeah, thanks very much for bringing that up. Although you didn't say don't necessarily pad out. Don't necessarily pad out. Well, in that situation, the padding out, yes, is if you absolutely want to store an on-disk format or something or an in-flash format that is somebody else's. If you're designing your own, yeah, do it, think about it, do it right. Doing it right, obviously, is not always the same thing for everybody. <laughs> But yes. regardless of uh, whether we fix uh, lin uh, kernel and libraries or not, uh, and whether we even have uh, uh, have uh, ability to rebuild something, I'm, I just checked uh, my Nexus phone, which yeah. has latest Android, uh, which is sure. still supported by Google, and it still contains kernel version 3.10. Yeah, yeah. So it is problem for all the embedded devices oh, and... all the embedded devices, the phones really and everything. Term. Yes, absolutely. That have got vendor kernels or random binary blobs, all of that kind of problem. Yeah, we need, this is why we need to be fixing this. Ideally, 20 years early, that might be hard. 15 years early is a good goal, and that will give us plenty of leeway before everything goes on fire. <laughs> Any more points? Thank you for coming along. Please dive in and help. The aren't actually specifically asked for me to run this at a session at DebConf. Um, there's a bunch of people going to be running similar sessions at other conferences or the distro conferences and everything over the next couple of years to raise awareness of this because it's, a, while again, it was awesome to see most people in the room knew about this before we started. It's not necessarily clear everybody knows the ramifications and why it's important to attack this early. Um, so thank you for coming along. Tell your friends as well, and dive in and help if you if you ha if you have the time. If you want to learn more, again check the, the various pages I've linked to. So the kernel and glibc uh, pages they link to each other as well. Uh, there's lots of good information. There is lots and lots of scope for people to get involved and make a difference now. Thank you very much. <laughs>